of a mighty rushing It's closer now than it's ever been. And I can almost hear the trumpet. As Gabriel sounds the call. At the midnight cry, we'll be going home when Jesus steps out on a cloud to call his children and the dead in Christ. Shall be quickly changed And at the midnight cry The bride of Christ will rise I look around Prophecies fulfilling and the signs of the times are appearing everywhere, and I can almost hear the Father. Son, go get my children. And at the midnight cry, at the midnight cry, when Jesus steps out. today or listening today online and I'm glad that you have tuned in I thought well that song I, I sang it just a few weeks ago but um, it's more appropriate with what I'm preaching today about the rapture of the church than at any other time that I could probably sing that song uh, the midnight cry from Matthew chapter 25 when Jesus comes in the midnight hour and so today that's where we are in this uh, part two of the first sermon in a series that I've entitled End Times Matter. I'll be preaching that 
series over the next few weeks. Um, uh, but I want to give you a chronological look at how Jesus saw the end times unfolding, which is our future. The conversation that uh, we learn about this from is uh, the one that takes place on the Mount of Olives as Jesus sat with his disciples and particularly the inner four. And uh, theologians refer to this as the Olivet Discourse. And uh, it was there his disciples asked him a question that we need to pay close attention to. What they did not ask him, though, was just as important as what they did ask him. And um, my slides aren't coming up for you yet, but they'll work on that as I preach on. Um, but they asked him uh, some questions, and I said what they did not ask him was as important as what they did. Jesus, the setting is that he was leaving the temple with them as they headed to the Mount of Olives. It was oftentimes they would go to the Mount of Olives and sit in that peaceful place and talk, and they would learn from the Master. And he was leaving the temple with them, headed there, and they were apparently, as they were leaving the temple, they were marveling at the architecture of the temple. And they were ad admiring stones and the handiwork of the artisans who built the uh, temple, and they were admiring the surrounding buildings, the beautiful artwork, the memorial decorations. And uh, so I want to share some things with you here, some slides and some scripture this morning uh, that's going to show you from the standpoint of the Galilean, Jewish Galilean wedding, uh, how the rapture is going to unfold in our future. And so that's where I'm heading with this this morning. If you will, bow your heads with me where you are right now, and let's invite the Lord into our service. Father in heaven, we may not be here all in seats in the pew, but wherever we are, Lord, you're with us. We're gathered together, even if it's online, virtual. And Lord, you've promised to be with us, and I believe, Lord, you transcend even that. So, Lord, this morning... We would ask that you open our hearts and ears to understand exactly what it is you want us to know. This is a profound teaching, Lord, some new things that have been uncovered in archaeological finds in the Middle East and in Israel in particular, in the Galilee in particular. And so, Father, this morning, <clears throat> we would ask that you would teach us your Holy Spirit would be inside each and every one of us. And we might be able to hear and understand all that you would have us to hear and understand today. And Lord, we thank you for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So as I said, the disciples are on the Mount of Olives there with Jesus. And they are about to ask him some questions. And as they were leaving the temple, they were admiring the handiwork and the artisans who built all of those buildings that surrounded the temple. And, uh, and Jesus said in Mark chapter 13 and verse 1, as Jesus was leaving the temple, one of the disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent build buildings. And then in verse 2 of Mark 13, Jesus told them the day was coming when not one of those stones would be left standing on top of another. He said, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. So he was saying that the temple, the building surrounding it, would one day be destroyed. So Jesus had once again whet their appetite about future events. And as he went from the temple with his disciples to the Mount of Olives, the disciples asked him a question in verses 3 and 4. And they said, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will these things happen and what will be the sign that they're all about to be fulfilled. And as I said, notice what they didn't ask him. Lord, are you sure these things are going to happen? Are you absolutely sure you're telling us the truth, Lord? They didn't ask him that. They instead said, Lord, tell us when will these things be and what will be the signs of your coming and the end of the age or the, or the end of the world. They were convinced at that point of Jesus' authority as a teacher. And they would soon be convinced, if not already, of his deity. Certainly they would be convinced of that at the resurrection, at all of those post-resurrection events. Now, why were they convinced? Why did they accept his teaching on these end time matters so readily? Again, I'm going to talk more about what Jesus taught them 
in the coming weeks. But today, I just want you to understand, understand this first. They believed him implicitly at this point. Now, the crucifixion did test their faith in Jesus, oh, to the limit. It even took Thomas a little more persuading after the resurrection. But on the whole, in general, at this point, during this Olivet Discourse, this conversation with Jesus about end times, they believed the Lord. And the reason was because they had walked with him. They had listened to him teach. They saw the miracles that he performed. But I want to show you today that it uh, actually goes so much deeper than that. <clears throat> and I want to center on the rapture of the church to bring all of this into focus for you. So, so let me start by a brief review of part one and then state some facts. First, we distinguish between the rapture and the second coming of Christ to the earth. You see, they are two separate events. The rapture, uh, at the rapture, only true believers who are longing, looking, and living for his return will see him. At the second coming, he'll be seen by everyone on planet earth. At the rapture, Jesus will return for his saints. At the second coming, he'll return with his saints. At the rapture, Jesus will not descend to earth. At the second coming, he will descend to the Mount of Olives as a prelude to his earthly reign. At the rapture, Jesus brings a blessing for his saints. But at the second coming, he brings judgment for those who have rejected him. The rapture could occur at any moment. It's imminent. The second coming will occur seven years after the rapture. Another fact, the church today has, I believe, at best, minimized the rapture and uh, at worst, rejected the rapture altogether. We have largely dismissed as a church the vital doctrine of the rapture. We've said it's either error or even fairy tale, uh, no longer to be believed. I showed these statistics in Part one, no majority of Christians believe any one thing about the rapture. Now, isn't that something when you consider the rapture as important as it's going to be, the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? We can't even get together on the win of it. Uh, we have all kind of different opinions that are flooding our schools and our universities, um, Bible colleges and seminaries that say it could be this or it could be that or it could be this. We just can't get together and we've largely dismissed this vital doctrine. I showed you all of these statistics and that bottom one, 25% don't even believe in a literal rapture at all and the majority of Christians don't believe any one thing about the rapture. And we can use one word today to describe the overall concern the church has for the rapture and that word is Apathy, apathy. It was not that way in generations past. We had a an, an, uh, desire to, to see the Lord come again. There was that urgency in our soul to believe and know that Christ was on his way back one day soon and we were going to see him again face to face. And we've become apathetic about Christ's return. We're not excited anymore. We're unconcerned. We're not expectant of the rapture anymore. We're indifferent. We're not enthusiastic. Instead, we're bored. In practice, we live and act as though Jesus will never keep his promise to return. Good Lord in heaven, church. Listen, if we're not excited about the, the rapture, which is our, our very Savior's promised return, then no wonder it's so easy to dismiss our personal devotions and our time alone with God. No wonder worship is a chore and an inconvenience. It's no wonder we've grown cold in our affection for Jesus. No wonder we no longer recognize that much of what we think, sue, do, and say is sin. And no wonder the world in all of its allurement has carried us away into sin and depravity and shamefulness. So it really is no wonder that we aren't concerned about sin or the confession and repentance of sin. The misunderstanding of the rapture as an imminent event on God's prophetic timetable, um, and the overwhelming uh, majority of Christians believe that, They've, they're misunderstood on the timing of it. And then you add the terrible unbelief of the rapture, which the Bible calls our blessed hope, by the way, from so many others, 
why it has weakened the church. Just this one doctrine that we cannot get together on from denomination to denomination and even within denominations. Paul explained the rapture to the Thessalonian church. And why did he do that? Well, he explained the rapture in perfect detail in order to strengthen their faith and their hope. And this is what he said when he told them to encourage one another with this truth. In 1 Thessalonians 4, he said, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which are alive and uh, remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And then Paul ends it up with, Therefore comfort or encourage one another with these words. But we in the church today, we have debated and we have argued over when the rapture will occur. Is it pre? Is it mid? Is it post-tribulation? Uh, we, we've argued over all of that to the point that we have forgotten the all-important question, which is why will the rapture occur? Why will it occur? We're so caught up in proving that our view is the right view that it's seldom mentioned, often unrealized, and it puts a, a wedge between us, and we don't even see it coming. But we never slow down long enough to ask, why will the rapture occur? And it's, uh, it has so watered down the essential doctrinal truth of the rapture to the point that church members, even Christian church members, have dismissed it as largely irrelevant if it's factual at all. But why is Jesus coming back? Why must all of this happen? Why must there be an end to the world system as we know it? Why must we be spending our waking moments determining that we're going to share Christ with the world? Those are better questions, much better. So just what is the point of the rapture? Is it just an ancient, uh, contrived superstition? Or did those who walked with Jesus Christ know and understand something much greater than you and I know today? Things that have been buried in the sands of time, but since have been uncovered. Well, I think that's the case, and I want to show you why. First, Jesus was not just a Jew. He was a Jew, but Jesus was a Galilean Jew. And so uh, Jesus being Galilean, all of his disciples were Galilean, except for Judas. Now, I don't know what you want to make of that. You take that and run with it if you want to. But all of his disciples were Galilean with the exception of Judas. Jesus, being from Galilee, he assembled Galileans around him. So when he spoke in the Galilean vernacular, there was no mistaking exactly what he meant, what he wanted those disciples to understand. Now, that is important for us to realize today and understand today because even though Jewish regions throughout uh, Israel shared the same culture, the Galileans developed customs and practices that were unique to, to just them. And remember, Jesus taught by using people's culture to communicate the nature of God and his kingdom. Why, Jesus uses words and analogies and symbols and parables that they could and would understand these Galileans. So those first century people, ex especially the, the Galileans, they understood Jesus clearly, completely, heart to heart did they hear him speak. Even those who were not Galileans, they knew the Galilean culture and customs and traditions and how it differed from their own in other parts of Israel. But these Galileans, they walked with Jesus, listening to his teachings, listening to his parables in their own peculiar, unique vernacular while all the time observing his miracles. And so they had confidence in his answers regarding the questions about his return. And Jesus did answer their questions in shocking detail. So I want to show you how Jesus used the Galilean wedding to teach about the rapture of the church. And we need to understand the Jewish wedding in general, but the Galilean wedding in particular. And as I said in part one of this message, it's notable to mention the fact that two-thirds of the gospel that we have written in our Bible, 
took place on that little strip of land next to the Sea of Galilee. It wasn't a sea at all, big lake. Most of the Jewish people in Israel in the first century did not live in Galilee. Yet the majority of the Gospels took place there. That's why it's important to learn and understand the, the culture, the idioms, the unique customs of the Galileans. And as I told you, um, uh, there was a fairly recent archaeological dig, excavation, near those shores of Galilee. And uh, it's uncovered some hidden information about some of the unique Galilean customs that we previously did not know. Now let me predicate everything I'm going to say on this. The Bible teaches that the church is the bride of Christ. Jesus is our bridegroom and we, true believers, are his bride. Now let me show you some scripture to establish that. Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 5 says, For your maker is your husband, the Lord Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. He is called the God of all the earth. In Ephesians chapter 5, the Bible says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. And listen, to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are all members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 says, I am jealous for you with a godly jealous. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. Revelation chapter 21 says, One of the seven angels who had seven bowls full of seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of of the Lamb. Revelation 19 says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her to wear. And there are many other references that declare that we, the church, true believers, are the bride of Christ. That's why Jesus' reference to the Galilean wedding is so significant as we understand the rapture of the church. So again, remember what I said last time. Once we establish the why of the rapture, we'll completely understand the when of the rapture, the when of the rapture, and we won't have to guess when it's going to occur or if it's going to occur. And these new discoveries in these archaeological digs are now enabling us to do that. So let me make a statement and then look closely with you at this unique Galilean wedding ceremony. Uh, and it will prove and demonstrate what I say. Now here's the statement. The Galilean wedding represents a premillennial, pre-tribulation rapture and the early church, understanding the unique Galilean customs and vernacular, knew this. So let's take a look at the ceremony. Again, we remember a key understanding to this teaching is the fact that Jesus and his disciples were Galilean, except for Judas. John 1 says, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses in the law and all the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph, Joseph from Nazareth. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Now, what did Nathanael mean by that? Well, Galileans stood out from the rest of Israel. They didn't blend in well. The region in Galilee was viewed as remote, away from the center of Judaism in Jerusalem, approximately 120 miles away, um, between one to two weeks' journey in that day. And uh, Galilee was not known for any form of cultural sophistication. One author, author wrote it this way, The province of Galilee... Is spoken of as having been, at that period, one of the most obscure and despised of the Roman Empire. And Nazareth has the misfortune of being represented then as an insignificant village whose inhabitants were ignorant and even 
immoral. So in the eyes of the more educated and urban Jews, the Galileans would have been judged as ignorant at best and perhaps simple-minded sinners at worst. But Jesus of Nazareth spoke to the disciples in the Galilean vernacular using their own cultural idioms. And one of the most prominent of Galilean customs and used most consistently throughout Jesus' teaching ministry was the Galilean wedding, which differed notably from the standard Jewish wedding of that day. The Galilean nuances spoke volumes to that early church because they understood the Galilean wedding and therefore they understood what Jesus was speaking to them about. But unfortunately, over the span of these last 2,000 years, these key understandings have been lost to so many of our churches and pulpits today. And only a handful of pastors and evangelists ever preach on prophecy in general and the rapture in particular, and that has been tragic to the church because that is where our hope lies. And I'll say it again, this is not all there is. Praise the Lord. Now, the three C's of the Bible wedding, Jewish wedding, were contract, consummation, and celebration. And I want to talk to you about those. We see all of those reflected in Isaac's marriage to Rebekah in Genesis 24, and Jacob's marriage to Leah, and then to Rachel in Genesis 29. So the ancient Jewish wedding practice began with the marriage covenant or the marriage contract. It was known as the ketubah. ketubah. When a young man desired to, to marry a young woman in ancient Israel, the first step would, would be the establishment of a marriage contract which the, the, uh, the groom's father would, would write and uh, the, the dowry that would be paid by the father of the groom to the father of the bride was decided. The groom would present the contract to the young woman. Her father would actually read the contract at the young woman's home, go to the home, describe the terms under which he would propose the marriage. Um, and the most important part of the marriage ceremony was the bride price. That is the price that the young man was willing to pay to marry the young woman. The payment was to be made to the young woman's father in exchange for his permission to marry. Now that was a, a Jewish wedding. But the ancient Galilean custom was different and found out as they were digging in Galilee and found uh, writings and found cultural nuances that we uh, otherwise would not have known. And so we found out that the Galilean custom of the marriage was different. Let me share some of that with you. First, we need to understand that in 30 A.D., Israel was occupied by the Romans. Life was hard. There was uh, little hope and joy there. But every time they were able to celebrate a wedding, that hope and joy came out and came to them. It was a joyous uh, village event, the marriage. And today in the Middle East, a wedding is still a very big deal, but even more so was it in Jesus' day. It was the single most important event for everyone in every town in Galilee, including Cana, Capernaum, Bethsaida, Chorazin, Tiberias, and Nazareth, which is a little further south. And word spread through the village like wildfire that a betrothal and engagement was taking place. And uh, the betrothal was different in Galilee from what I just described. It didn't take place in the bride's home. The groom didn't go to the bride's home. It took place at the city gate. This is where the elders were every day. This is where they held court, so to speak. And their responsibility at that gate, one of their responsibilities, was to ratify all agreements in the town uh, right there at the gate uh, of the city or the village. So you see, there was a marriage covenant covenant to be ratified, to be agreed to. And all covenants, all agreements between parties took place at the gate of the village so there would be many, many witnesses. And so the buzz of the betrothal got around the village. People didn't have much else to be excited about, but they got excited now. There's going to be a wedding, a joyous time. And everyone headed to the gate. They knew the custom. And they headed to the gate to watch and join in the happiness and the delight and the bliss of the, the occasion. 
Weddings were welcome respites and breathers from the hardness of all of that Roman occupation. So everyone turned out, even those who weren't family members. And the Galileans believed that you could not ratify a covenant without witnesses. So a proposal written and read aloud by the groom's father was presented as the groom-to-be and the bride-to-be and their families faced one another. The terms of the contract were spelled out in complete and clear detail with all of the witnesses present so that the bride could never say, well, I didn't know that, or I didn't understand that, or I didn't know this was coming. No, no, no. It was plain. It was obvious. Read before everyone, all of the witness. And then after the father of the groom read the terms of the marriage covenant, um, and again, he read it out loud for everyone to hear. There were some other twists to the Galilean wedding that were different from other Jewish weddings of that day. The dowry was paid to the father of the bride, and not as a gift per se, but as an insurance policy, if you will, for the bride in case anything happened to her beloved during the betrothal period before they were married. But what comes next would shape the future for all generations to come. This is when everyone in the village would hold their breath. The father, he, all assembled at the gate, all of the witnesses in the town. He, the father, then hands the groom-to-be. He hands him a pitcher of wine and a cup. The groom then pours wine into that ceremonial cup. It's called the cup of joy. He then hands that cup to his prospective bride-to-be. The betrothal, the engagement could not be completed or ratified without her acceptance of the terms. And she demonstrated that acceptance by drinking from the cup. Unlike other Jewish weddings, the Galilean bride was the center of focus and not the groom. She had the right to refuse the wine if the terms of the marriage covenant weren't acceptable to her. And the covenant would be rejected. There'd be no betrothal or marriage if she refused the wine. It was her choice. The father or the groom-to-be could not force her to accept those marriage terms. But once she drank from the cup, in essence saying, I accept the terms of the covenant that had been read, She handed it back to the groom, and he too would then drink from the cup of joy, fully ratifying the covenant. But what was discovered buried in those sands of time over the last one to two years was something the groom-to-be would say at every betrothal at the gate of every city when a wedding ceremony was beginning. After the groom drank from the cup to ratify the covenant as well, Here's what he said. You are now consecrated to me by the law of Moses and I will not drink of this cup again until I drink it anew with you again in my father's house. Now, to understand why that discovery and that phrase is so unique and profound to that Galilean wedding, we actually have to look at another event that's recorded in Scripture. During the Last Supper, Jesus shared a cup of wine with his disciples and he was establishing a new covenant with them. Now listen now, after the disciples and Jesus drank of that cup together, Jesus then said something similar that each of those Galilean disciples would have heard. They would have heard from their own wedding or all of the other weddings in Galilee. Do you remember what Jesus said? He said this, Mark 14, This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many For the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And he called it the new covenant. And just like the marriage betrothal, once it was ratified, it could not be broken. So all this new covenant, uh, Jesus, the new covenant he was speaking about, he said, is sealed in his blood symbolized by the Last Supper, by the drinking of the cup, also cannot be broken. If he breaks it, Jesus breaks it, he would not, he could not be Savior and Lord. So with the drinking of the cup, the breaking of the bread at the Last Supper, 
Jesus deliberately and intentionally set into motion events that would be uh, unimaginably important. That night at what we call the Last Supper, Jesus is saying, we are no longer two, we are now one. We have a common union, communion. And those disciples represented us in that Last Supper. They represented the church. Jesus is talking as a bridegroom is talking to his bride and they understood exactly what Jesus was saying. When they drank from the cup, they knew this was how they sealed their, their Galilean weddings. And this was the new covenant and they were accepting, they were ratifying the terms of the new covenant. In other words, when those Galilean disciples heard what Jesus said that night, they heard only one word, wedding, wedding, wedding. And I believe this explains later on in the gospel accounts why the disciples asked when these end time things will take place and not why. They already understood the why of Jesus' return. Something I think the church has forgotten. He's coming to get his bride to take us to our new home. And they believed that Jesus would return and that he would not, he could not break that covenant promise. And if we are to be his true bride, neither can we break that covenant promise. Listen, these Galileans made the connection. They were there at Jesus' first recorded miracle at the wedding in Cana of Galilee as he turned that water into wine. And that wedding, like all others they experienced in Galilee, had the same dynamics that Jesus was describing at the Last Supper. They were familiar with it, right down to the promise of his imminent return to get them and take him to his father's house. Now, the conclusion of the betrothal, which is the engagement time. By the way, the betrothal carried a lot more weight than what we call engagement today. The betrothal was where everything took place. Uh, the, the marriage contract was read and ratified and could not be broken. But the conclusion of the engagement time here at the gate was just the beginning of a series of events, a long journey to an unimaginable conclusion. So everyone went back home. But for the bride and the groom, there were some very important things about to happen in both of their lives. At this point, the young man and the young woman would be betrothed. Read what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11. I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. So the marriage was official. The only difference was that the marriage was not yet consummated. Now, a typical betrothal period could be anywhere between one to two years. And during this time, the bride and the bridegroom would each be preparing for the wedding. And they wouldn't see each other during that time. And Jesus fulfilled that Galilean bridegroom practice at the Last Supper as well. Again, Jesus poured wine for his disciples and he described the significance of the cup in representing the bride price for the marriage contract. Let me read all of that again. Matthew 26 says it. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Jesus said, it's going to cost me my life's blood. And when the disciples drank the cup, they accepted that contract. That Jesus, their bridegroom, would be the only way to get to the Father's house. And at each communion, we, as we drink the cup and eat the bread, as Jesus has instructed us, we reflect on Christ's blood sacrifice. We look forward to his return. We remember the price he paid for the forgiveness of our sins and the guarantee of our eternal life through him. And the price he paid gave us life, and it's also seen as the bride price. So the cup in our own communion services signifies our acceptance of his terms as bridegroom. No man gets to the Father 
except through him. Now prior to the wedding, and still a practice for many Jewish women today, the bride would partake in a mikvah or cleansing bath. And listen to this. Mikvah is the same Hebrew word used for baptism. And don't miss that example. After his ascension, after he goes away to prepare our place, the mikvah or baptism that Jesus provides for his bride is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And on one occasion, while he was eating with them, before he ascended, Jesus gave them this command. He said in Acts 1-4, Don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now another Galilean practice for the bridegroom to send, uh, 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 for the uh, Galilean wedding was for the bridegroom to send special gifts to the bride during that long betrothal period, reminding her of his love and his appreciation for her. And the gifts that Jesus gives to us are the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus described this gift in John chapter 14. He said, but the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you and remind you of everything I said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. So the bride-to-be and the groom-to-be return to their respective homes to get prepared for the wedding. And over the next one to two years, the groom would gather materials to build on to his father's house. And this addition that he built on was called an insula. Clusters of buildings where extended families lived together. The sons would build on to their father's house to bring their bride in and raise their new family there. And uh, all of the grandparents, the cousins, the uncles, the aunts, all lived and interacted together in that insula. And the sons married. And uh, so they would add on to the insula. So after the betrothal, the son would return to his village and build new rooms onto his father's house. And also he would have to craft new furniture like tables and stools and beds. And he would have to get the entire angel repair, uh, prepared in every way for his bride. And the son, anxious to be married, waited for the day when his father declared that the preparations were complete. And then he could finally go get his bride and bring her to their new home and marry her there in the family insula. Jesus presented a beautiful picture of heaven when he said in John 14, In my Father's house are many rooms. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And that word picture presented Jesus as a bridegroom. That's what they heard, that word again, wedding. Preparing new rooms for his followers in the insula of heaven, his father's house. And during this time as well, the bride was not only anticipating the bridegroom's return, but she had responsibilities to take care of. Most importantly, she had to be ready at all times because she didn't know when the groom would return. Now, you all are understanding this, I hope. The bride represents the church. The groom represents Jesus Christ. But she had bridesmaids to help her. She has to make her wedding dress, taking special meticulous care that it's perfect, no flaws in it. She searches to find just the right fabric and color and design. And along with her vigilance in waiting for the groom to return, all the while she was being faithful to him. In fact, if she were found to be unfaithful during this time of the covenant betrothal, uh, the contract would be voided. And she could be put to death. So she's always ready, waiting, anticipating, staying faithful to the groom. He could come at any moment and she had to be ready. She could not be caught off guard or in some way be unprepared or unready to go. So the bride didn't just sit around waiting. She wasn't just being idle. No, she was busy in preparation as well. She was to occupy her time in preparation for the bridegroom. Luke 19, 13 says, So he called ten of his servants, delivered to them ten minas, and said to them, Do business till I come. And church, listen, neither are we, the bride of Christ, to sit idle and wait. We are to be busy with the great commission. That's our business 
until Jesus returns. If you funnel everything down to what is our duty today and you funnel it down, Jesus said it can all be summed up in two commandments. Number one, uh, love the Lord God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and then love your neighbor as yourself. That's the great commandment. And then we have the great commission that Jesus said and talked about four times before his ascension to go into the world to go into your sphere of influence and tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. Help them to find their way through this life so that they might be added to that number whose name is in the Lamb's book of life. So she's busy. She's busy um, in this Galilean wedding ceremony. And at this point, it gets very interesting. Typically, after a year or more, unknown period of time, as the bride was making preparations for the groom to return on that unknown day, she was excitedly anticipating the day when she's going to be reunited with her groom. That's an example. That's the Galilean wedding. The church today, the bride of Christ today, is not excited that we're going to be reunited with our groom one day. I know there are pockets of people who are are looking and longing and living for that day. But I'm talking about on the whole, by and large, the church is not looking and anticipating that day we're going to be with the Lord, taken back to our father's house, his father's house, and the place that he's prepared for the marriage. And uh, the bride in Jesus' day, because she didn't know the hour of his Return. She had to be ready at all times. But here's something also unique to the Galilean wedding that they've recently uncovered. Not only did the bride not know the hour of the groom's return, neither did the groom, neither did anyone else in the village. But there was one person who knew, only one, the father of the groom. Only the father knew when the wedding and the marriage feast was going to take place because it was his call. Remember, it was the father who read the conditions on behalf of the son at the betrothal at the gate. The very one who provided, the very one who provided the payment for a bride for his son. He alone knows the day and hour when he will tell his son to go and retrieve his bride. Now listen, in all other Jewish weddings outside of Galilee in that day, there was a designated wedding day. A sign that the bride's home during the betrothal and everyone knew the day there was no mystery to it but not so in the Galilean wedding in the Galilean wedding the groom would finish the preparation of building the uh, insula making preparation gathering all of the food for the marriage feast and he would say father it is finished I've done all the preparation I'm ready to get my bride but the father would say to the groom you wait son I'll tell you when you can go get your bride. So the groom waited patiently for the instruction from his father. And for, for those Galileans, in that day it was a surprise wedding for the Galileans. And this goes back to several accounts in the Bible where Jesus tells his disciples, no one knows the time of his return, the rapture of the church. No one knows, not even the son, Jesus said. Remember, they had asked them, when, when will all this be? What will be the signs of your coming? And Jesus said in Matthew 28, But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. And those Galilean disciples heard it again, that word, wedding, wedding. They knew it. They completely understood what Jesus was teaching. The only person who could send the groom to get his bride was the father of the groom. And the only one who could send Jesus to get his bride to church is God the Father. Only he knows the day and the hour. Now the groom also has much preparation to make as well. Not only with building the insula on his father's house, building and buying furniture and uh, materials and food for the uh, marriage feast. But he has to be sure that the marriage feast is perfect, ready for the bride and for all of the guests. And in that day, according to those village sizes and those who actually attended, there could be one, 200, maybe more guests, and everything had to be just right. 
The feast could last for several days, sometimes up to a week, and there must be enough food and wine to last. So the groom is excited, and he's eager to show his bride all of the preparations that he's made. And Jesus, too, is eager and excited to get his bride and bring her to the Father's house to see what he's prepared. Listen to what he says in John 14. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again, receive you to myself, that where I am there you may be also, and where I go you know, and the way you know. Now let me open that up a little bit. Let me open that up a little bit. Remember, these, dis these disciples are understanding the teaching in terms of Jesus' example of the Galilean wedding. And, and, and let me state some of those that we've already talked about. Only the Father knows the hour for the groom to retrieve his bride. Only God in heaven knows when he's going to say to Jesus, Son, go get your children. The groom has prepared a place for them to live. Jesus said, I have gone so that I might prepare a place for you. And the bride's been busy getting herself ready and making sure her gown is spotless. And that's the duty of the church today. We are to be looking and longing and living our lives in such a way that it glorifies God. And we're looking for His coming. The bride has been watchful and waiting and staying pure. The church today can ill afford to compromise with the world. The bride expects the groom any day, any hour. The return of Jesus is imminent. It could happen at any moment. The groom will one day return to bring his bride to his father's house. Jesus is one day going to step out a cloud and holler and say, come up here, as we see in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1, representing, represent, representing the rapture. He'll say, come up here. And so Jesus will do that on one sweet day. And the groom prepares a wedding feast for his bride and his guests. And the Bible tells us that Jesus will have us all, the church, as his wedding guests or his bride and the wedding guests, which will be the angels and the other hosts of heaven, all at a marriage feast of the Lamb. Jesus is saying these same things to the disciples. And, and look at Thomas in that passage of John 14. Thomas is the doubter in the group. Look at verses 5 and 6. Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Jesus says, no one comes to the Father except through me. The bride could never get to the Father's house, to that new insula that's been built for her, unless she went there with the groom. She can't get anyone else to take her. There is no other way. And Jesus said, if you know me, you know the Father as well. Because the bride heard the terms of the covenant at the village gate read by the Father. It was there she, the bride, met the groom's father. She knew the father. It was there she ratified the contract by drinking from the cup of wine that was handed to her by the groom whose father handed it to him. And Jesus said there, if you know me, then you know the Father. You know the Father. So these Galilean disciples... They knew exactly what Jesus was saying. They were hearing that word again, wedding, wedding. And they were hearing it over and over and over in, re in respect to Jesus' coming again. So the groom finished his work, and he's excitedly waiting on the father's command to go get his bride. It's finished. He's done. And the bride is eagerly waiting, looking down the road, listening for the sounds, waiting, watching for his coming. Now, in the Galilean wedding, the groom would come at night, usually, traditionally, around midnight, but certainly in the early hours of the morning, just after midnight. That's when, traditionally, the groom would start the procession from his father's house, his insula, to come and get his bride. Jesus also said to his disciples in Matthew 25, as he told about the, the parable of the ten virgins in keeping with the wedding. He said in Matthew chapter 25, At that time the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. 
Five of them were foolish, five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but didn't take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out. There's that midnight cry. Here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up, trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell the oil and buy some for yourself. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The ten virgins who were ready, or the virgins who were ready, went with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Now let me open that up a little bit. So, the Galilean tradition was that on a day that only the father knew, he would wake his son and say to him, Now, son, now is the time. Son, go get your bride. And then excitedly, in the, middle of the, in the middle of the night, the groom and his groomsmen would leave the father's house, excited as they approached the bride's home. Uh, one, of the broom, one of the groomsmen then would, uh, would blow the shofar down the road, that trumpet, to signal to the bride, to let her know the groom is on his way. And she would immediately rise to meet her husband and have him take her to the father's house to consummate the marriage and celebrate the wedding feast. So let's talk about that part now, the consummation. And as we do, I'll do a little summary as well. And, and as we've already confirmed, in ancient Galilee, the bridegroom could get his bride only after the father approved the date. And similarly, again, just to remind you, Jesus said in Mark 13, no one knows the day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. And listen to what he says, be on guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come. And in the Galilean custom, while the bridegroom was preparing the wedding chamber and the insula, the bride was considered to be consecrated. She was considered to be sanctified. That is, she was set apart because she had been bought with a price. Well, we, the church, have been set apart today, waiting on the groom to return. We've been bought with a price. And if the bride in Jesus' day, if she, would wear, if she went out, she would wear a veil so others would know that she's betrothed. And just to make the analogy, as Christians, when we go out of this world, others should know, too, that we are betrothed to Christ, our groom, our husband. They ought to know, the world ought to know who we are. We ought not to be ashamed to tell them who we are, whether they like us and whether they don't like us. One day, hopefully, it sinks into their heart and they'll become Christians themselves and they'll be saved and they'll be attending the same marriage feast of the Lamb that we're attending. We cannot be ashamed. We have to be ready, alert. We don't know when that time is going to come. So during this time, this bride, sanctified, set apart for the groom, prepared herself even more for the marriage. She didn't know when the broom was coming. Um, um, and so it was normal for her to station members of her family or her bridesmaids to be looking out every night uh, for the groom's approach, standing outside maybe. And since the bridegrooms um, typically came for their brides in the middle of the night, the Bible says to steal them away, the groom would often come like a thief in the night. Uh, uh, often around the midnight hour. Listen to what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, making this analogy. But concerning the times and seasons thereof, see, Paul's writing to these Thessalonians to give them this hope about the rapture of the church because they were wondering because of false teachers who had entered into their church that has Jesus already come or has Jesus abandoned his idea of coming back to us and keeping his promise? So Paul writes that whole letter, 1 Thessalonians, to them, assuring them that Jesus has not forgotten Jesus is coming, and this is what he said. But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. You see, there were some who were saying, why, Jesus hasn't come already. He's not going to come now. And people are saying that today in our churches. Well, why has Jesus been 2,000 years coming? Why hasn't he come? Number one, the Father hasn't said yet to go and get my children. When he gets that command, trust me, he's coming. And if you are not ready, you will not go. Second reason he hasn't come yet is because the Bible says it's not God's wish that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. God loves us so much, uh, he showed it and demonstrated it at the cross, you can't show a greater love. But God loves us so much that, that, that he's waiting 
He wants everyone who can be, who will be saved. It's a whosoever will gospel. He wants all to come to repentance. That's why we haven't seen the Lord back yet. But that's what people are teaching then. They're teaching now. Jesus had not come. He's probably not going to come. But listen to what Paul says. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. How does a thief come in the night? Do you know he's coming? No. You don't know when the thief is coming. He just shows up at your house. So the bride would have to have her lamp and her belongings ready at all times. Her sisters or bridesmaids would also be waiting, keeping their lamps trimmed, symbolizing their readiness in anticipation of that late night arrival and festivities and the approach of the bridegroom. And when the bridegroom's Galilean father deemed that the wedding preparations have been completed, they're, they're good, I've searched them over, I've looked at them, everything is ready, that he would go wake his son up and tell him to go fetch his bride. Go fetch his bride. And the groomsman uh, uh, would, would be walking down the road that entourage with the groom, and one of those groomsmen would sound the trumpet, the Bible says, in those Galilean uh, ceremonies. And there would be the shouts of all of the wedding party that was coming. Doesn't that remind you of what the Lord said? There's going to be the shout of the archangels, There's going to be the trumpet of God at the rapture, and all the dead in cries will rise first, and then all of us who are left, or, or all of us who are alive behind, we're going to all. Go up in the air together, and so shall we ever be with the Lord in the air. And so here comes the bridegroom. Here comes his groomsmen. They're sounding the trumpet. There's the shouts of the wedding party. And so the bride, she has some uh, warning uh, to gather her belongings. She doesn't have much time now, but she's got to get everything together because the groom is going to abduct her secretly like a thief in the night, take her back to the wedding chamber in his father's house. Now, Inside the bride's house, inside the bride's house, at this point it was exciting and electrifying, exhilarating, uh, a moment of jubilant joy as the whole house awakened because the day of fulfillment has arrived. The bridegroom and his friends would come into the bride's house and get the bride and her bridesmaids and take them to the groom's father's house. And listen, Part of, the, listen, this is great, part of the Galilean tradition was something that ought to blow our minds. The Lord pays so much attention to detail in the word of God. As the groom retrieves his bride to return to the father's house, part of his responsibility had been, as he waited for his father's command to go get the bride, part of his responsibility was to build an elegant seat for his bride to sit on for the trip to the father's house. You see that? She was, listen, don't miss it. She was lifted in the air and carried all the way by those grooms that she was carried all the way back to that wedding chamber with no feet on the ground, lifted up. And just as the bridegroom would come for the bride in the middle of the night with a shout and the sound of the shofar, so the Lord Jesus is going to come for us and lift us up. First Thessalonians says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will come with him. Uh, those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. And different than any other wedding in Israel was the Galilean wedding in which the bride would be placed on a stool or on a, on a chair and she would be lifted up by those groomsmen and taken back to the groom's insula, the father's house. And as they entered the father's house, the bridegroom would take his bride into the wedding chamber where they would spend seven days. And as he entered his father's house, only those who were alert and were awake in town, those who heard the groom coming and followed the wedding party into the, into the house at that moment, they, they were the only ones allowed to come in and celebrate the marriage feast. Those who were listening, those who were watching, uh, everyone wanted to be at that marriage feast. It was a big event, but you had to be listening and watching, knowing when the groom was coming. And then the door was promptly shut, and those who were late in coming 
Those who were not alert, those who were not looking, were not allowed in. The door was shut and would not be opened until the marriage feast was over. Incidentally, the Bible says that we, the church, true believers who have been excitedly awaiting for the Lord's return, will spend seven years uh, in heaven with our husband Jesus, seven years in heaven at the marriage feast of the Lamb, while great pain and suffering and judgment takes place for those who are left behind on the earth because the wrath of God is poured out on unbelievers in proportions and, uh, and, and devastations that we can't even imagine today. Now, interestingly, on that first night, the bridegroom's friend would wait outside the door of the wedding chamber. And when the marriage was consummated, the bridegroom would tell his friend through the door. And then the friend would announce to the assembled guest the start of the celebration. And then the guest and the family who were already in, already waiting outside of the wedding chamber, they were already in the house. The, the guest, they would celebrate for those seven days until the bride and the bridegroom emer emerged from the wedding chamber. And at that time, the groom would bring his wife out and he would introduce her to the whole community, to all there at the party. And listen to this. Seven years, after seven years, the Lord is also going to introduce his bride, we, the church, to everyone. Because we're going to return with him then to set up his millennial kingdom on the earth. Listen, church, the Galilean wedding model is the template that Jesus uses to describe the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. The seven days symbolize the seven-year tribulation in which the church, as the bride of Christ, is in heaven. It is a premillennial, pre-tribulation rapture, and the early church, understanding the Galilean wedding and the Galilean vernacular, they knew it. But unfortunately, by the third century A.D., different prophetic interpretations began to develop, and they have filtered forward into our churches today. And the Galilean key has been lost in so many pulpits today. And sadly, it's reflected in recent polling data obtained from a 1,000 Protestant pastors in the United States. I showed you some of those before. Lifeway Research finds out that approximately 25% of the church doesn't even believe in a literal rapture, which is stunning to me. The phrase, blessed hope, does that mean anything to us? The phrase, blessed hope, that Paul wrote about extensively doesn't even register for, for many Christians today or pastors today. But our blessed hope that Paul refers to is the rapture of the church. Look at Titus 2. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Listen, while we wait for the blessed hope, what is the blessed hope, Paul? The appearing of the Lord, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And most of us would observe uh, that we live in fast and troublesome times. Won't you agree with me? Sin is pulling us this way and that way. If ever there was a time to rediscover our Galilean roots, it would be today. This is not all there is, church. And Jesus will return soon on some appointed day only known by the Father. We need to quit fighting and uh, arguing over the when of the rapture and realize the why of it. Jesus is coming to get to get us in order to keep his promise. He's coming again at the rapture and then at the second coming because he promised that he had a place for us. He's prepared for us. He's coming to get us, to take us where he is. A lot of times what you hear from our pulpits today are, well, Jesus is coming to be where we are. No, I don't accept that. I don't want to accept that. I don't want to stay where I am. I'm going because Jesus said, I'm getting you to take you where I am in my Father's house. We got to be ready. We got to be living for his uh, arrival every moment of the day. Only then, only then will we escape the horrible, dreadful, shocking wrath to come on this earth to those who are left behind, those who are not saved. And listen, you cannot, as bride, you cannot get into the insula, the home that's being built for you now. You won't get in there apart from going in with the groom. Can we understand that? 
That was unique to the Galilean wedding. And Jesus taught that as a part of his second coming. No man gets to the Father, Jesus said, but through me. My question, are you ready? Revelation 19.9 says, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Are you ready? There's a great wedding feast waiting if you are ready. Have you reserved your place at the table? Jesus is coming again to this earth to receive us into our insula, into our mansion, our room, our home that he has prepared for us. Are you ready? Let's pray. Father in heaven, I so thank you, Lord, that you have given us spiritual eyes and ears to see and hear your word, Lord. And when we look at it, Lord, from the Galilean aspect, that wedding in Galilee, what you taught so much of the time, Lord, we understand and see that our hope is in Jesus. And we understand why no one can go to the Father except through Jesus, our groom. And Father, there's going to come a day when you will step, step down, when you are going to step out on the cloud, and you're going to call us up to be with yourself for that marriage feast in heaven, among other things. But Lord, there's so many that are not ready. I pray, dear God, that you would open the hearts of pastors and Christians across this land to see these hidden treasures and mysteries within the word of God that show us exactly, not coincidence, but exactly, not just implying, but showing precisely your coming and how important it is that we be prepared, that we be waiting. Father, I know there are people listening to my voice today. They're not ready. They're more concerned about where they're going out to have their next drink. They're more concerned about where they're going to spend this time away from the church physically instead of watching or participating in some kind of worship, where they can go, what they can do. They're not concerned about spiritual matters. And I know, Father, they'll be left behind because of that. God, I don't want that. You don't want that. It's not my wish, Lord, for anybody to perish either. I know it's not your wish. I have family members that need you. We all do. And God, give us strength and boldness, courage to no matter who we see, when we see them, to, to talk about you, to say a word for you, to talk about heaven and hell, to talk about the rapture that's coming soon. But God, we don't want to be caught off guard. May this message today, Lord, be a warning and uh, be something, Lord, that we all We'll pay attention to. And if we do not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, Lord and Savior, then Lord, I pray today that you would convict the hearts of those who have been listening and watching that today might be the day when they say yes to Christ. Because without him, there's no way for us to leave this world alive. We'll fall into spiritual death, the Bible calls it. Outer darkness gnashing of teeth, fire that burns but never consumes. And that's not a punishment from God. That's a punishment for our own um, dereliction, for our own decision to live our life for pleasure and to do things this world can offer instead of concentrating on those things that you want to give us, that good, abundant life and then that eternal life. Father, I pray that you forgive the sins of many today, enter into their heart as they request that you forgive their sins and save many as a result of this. God, we love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all for being out there today. I'm glad you are. And uh, for those of you, a couple of you in our sanctuary today, I thank you so much for being here as well. Soon, I'll be meeting with you on August the, I believe it's the 2nd or the 4th, I can't remember. I'll let you know for sure next week. But we're going to have another Zoom meeting to discuss 
coming back together as a church, perhaps sometime in August for us to come back. But we'll have that meeting, uh, whatever that Tuesday night is, August the 2nd or August the, the 4th. I look forward to that night. I look forward to the day when we can all meet together again. Until we can do that, though, we are still on mission, the church. We are still commanded to love our neighbor as ourself. We're still commanded to love God with all of our heart. We're still commissioned to carry the gospel around the world. None of that has changed. In fact, probably not nearly as, it, it's not nearly so unimportant. It's very important now with the coronavirus that we tell everyone that we can before it's eternally too late. It's a good time to be talking to people today about spiritual matters, about life and death, about heaven and hell. We need to be doing that. And may God convict you if you sit five minutes with someone and don't begin to talk about your Savior that you're waiting on, waiting on, anticipating his soon return. God bless you. I love you. If you have made any decisions today, I would like to know about them. You can uh, get me at our church office, 843-797-2982, or use my cell phone, 843-670-7255. I have some information that I would like to get to you if you have made a decision to ask Jesus into your heart and forgive you of your sins and save your soul and repent of all of those sins. Just give me a call and let me know. God bless you. I will see you, if not at the rapture, I'll see you Thursday night for our Zoom meeting. And uh, I'm pulling for the rapture to come between now and then, but I want you to be ready. I want you to be ready. See you then.